Hello. So in this video, I wanted to uh, demonstrate the Lorentz invariance of the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian. So um, we have all this stuff. If we have a so a Lorentz transformation, so we have you know do we do this kind of thing, and this. Lorentz transformation matrix satisfies this condition, uh, then our fields will transform like this. So a scalar field goes like this, and a vector field goes like this. And this is uh, thinking of them uh, as thinking of transforming the fields in an active way, meaning actually rotating the fields. So I can um, I can draw a little picture to demonstrate that. So say we have just our phi of x. So a, a scalar field, you know, just has a, a value at each point. So let me just say, let me just say it's, I don't know. Oh, well, here, let me just say it's warm over here and cold over here. And for our, so we're going to do a Lorentz transformation of that field. So we have our same coordinate grid here. And we're going to, you know, literally rotate the field. So let's say we do it 90 degrees, 90 degrees uh, clockwise. So now it'll be warm over here and cold over here. Something in the other places, I don't know. Uh, but the point is, so all this formula, uh, this formula is saying is that if I take my new field and look at some point x, so you know if I look at this point, that should be the same as looking at the old field, but evaluating at this point. So this point is just, you know, okay, so x, so x is this point in both cases. But so x, um, but with the inverse transformation acting on it, that's, so the transformation was a clockwise rotation. So the inverse transformation is a counterclockwise rotation. So I look 90 degrees, you know, over here. And sure enough, I get the same value. It's warm right here, and it's warm right here. So that's all this uh, is saying. Now for the vector field, uh, you can do a similar thing, only now we'll have, um, I may be too lazy to, uh, okay, okay, good. Let's try that, let's try it, let's try it. If I delete these. So instead of a value at each point, I'll have a vector. So say this vector here and this vector here. And then when I rotate this vector field now, again by a 90 degree clockwise rotation, it'll be like this and like this. And I play the same kind of game. If I look, if I say, you know, x is here, then that should be the same as looking, okay, not here, but here. Um, but clearly, so the, the vector here is not the same as the vector here. I need to rotate it to get the same vector. So that's why I have this term out front here. So uh, the point is for you know vector fields and for tensor fields, you get more complex transformation laws because you have to look not you only you don't only have to worry about the place that you're evaluating um, the field at, but also that the vectors of the vector field have changed direction. So that's why you have this term. 
Um, so that's 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 all fun. But uh, anyway, you you have these equations. So um, the next thing we want to do is so take our Klein Gordon Lagrangian and use these laws, these rules, to see how it transforms under a Lorentz transformation. And uh, yeah, so we have everything we need. We know how these derivatives will transform. We know how just this phi will transform. So um, yeah, so the phi is transformed kind of trivially, so you know, whatever. But uh, these ones, you have to do a little bit of work. So here I've just written out. Uh, so this will become, uh, you know, this whole thing. If I use this rule twice, it will become this, which looks, okay, it looks very messy, honestly. It doesn't look uh, that good, but it's yeah. I just I just use this rule. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, and d mu of phi just becomes d rho of phi, but evaluated at uh, this point instead. And we also need our uh, inverse transformation thing. And then similarly for the d mu of phi, it's here. And our, our eta mu nu just carries over, so that's still there. It doesn't uh, it doesn't depend on the coordinates, so it's uh, yeah it's still the same. So we have this, and now what can we do with this? Well, the first thing I'm, I'm going to do is move all these terms with uh, these labels over to the left. So, you know, work, this is all in index notation, so technically speaking, all of these are just numbers. So I'm free to, you know, I'm not commute in, in a way. Um, I'm not literally commuting these operators, but since I've written in index notation, they're, they're basically just numbers in this expression. So I'm free to move these um, over. So... I just moved, yeah, just this thing over here, and as well as the eta, the uh, Minkowski metric over here. And then I've just rewritten these d rho phi. Instead of this, I've just written y, because, which is what David Tong does, because it gets kind of tiring writing this. And similarly um, for d sigma phi. Um, okay, so now that I've got this, um, I, you want to do something with... It's not obvious what you can do here. It wasn't obvious to me. It took me a little bit to figure out something to do. And the key that I found was, um, was uh, using something, some kind of identity for these two operators. And to find that identity, we can go back up to our original, um, I don't know what you would call this, this kind of, uh, it's not a I don't know if it's a definition of the Lorentz transformation, but anyway, the Lorentz transformations have to satisfy this. So starting from this, um, if I multiply on the left both sides of this equation by an inverse of lambda, so I basically lambda, uh, you know, gamma mu, I've called it. So I do this, uh, then I can, so this is, you know, an inverse times the thing. Uh, so this will be an identity matrix, uh, but the identity in uh, you know, index notation is just the Kronecker delta. So this becomes Kronecker delta gamma sigma. And then I can use that delta gamma sigma on this sigma here. So I will just have eta gamma 
tau. And this is still that. And the right side is still the right side. So, but this is the important point, this relation. So I have kind of an inverse times an eta is equal to a non-inverse thing times an eta. And that's what I'll use. That's what I will use here. So if I just use that identity that I showed, uh, I get another, you know, instead of an inverse uh, uh, Lorentz transformation times the Minkowski metric, I get uh, Minkowski times the uh, lambda itself. And the usefulness of that is now I have, uh, again, I, I can move this over here. The fact that eta is here and lambda is here doesn't prevent me from, uh, you know, uh, multiplying these two things. And then this is again an inverse and lambda and its inverse multiplied together. And this will give me a delta rho tau. So I can replace this tau with a rho, and I will just get this. Um, so this looks exactly the same as what I started with, only instead of the coordinates being, instead of the fields being evaluated at x, they're evaluated at y, which again is lambda inverse x. And so our total Lagrangian, we can see it will transform as uh, it will become this. So, um, yeah. And so it has the same form as before, only uh, evaluated at y instead of x. And that means the equations of motion that you get from this Lagrangian will just be uh, the same as before, only evaluated at the point y instead of x. And um, so that's, sorry, oh, yeah. that is the, what, well, it's at least what David Tong defines as a Lorenz invariant theory. So if you end up basically with a Lagrangian that looks the same as before, only evaluated at uh, this point instead of x, then, uh, yeah, it's Lorentz invariant.